The modern world has inherited a rich legacy from those who came before us. Ancient places speak of great civilizations that once flourished, then passed into memory. Though we have learned to decipher artifacts and ruins like this, mystery often dwells here. Why, with razor-sharp precision, do so many monuments of antiquity seem to point towards certain stars in the sky? Why do so many ancient texts contain references to strange flying objects centuries before the invention of the airplane? In all of the classical ancient cultures that we know of, there have been descriptions of unusual aerial phenomena. And in many cases, these can be interpreted as some kind of craft piloted by intelligent beings. What are UFOs? Do they exist? If so, could they originate from elsewhere in the universe? I think it's obvious that there are many other intelligent life forms in the universe, and I don't dismiss for a moment the possibility that they have uh, visited Earth, perhaps in the past, perhaps even now. With the recent discovery that life might have once existed on Mars, it is surely one of the most enduring of mysteries. Are we alone? or have we been visited by travelers from other worlds? Join us as we attempt to unravel the riddle of ancient UFOs. Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all trace their beginnings to this place as well as the Sumerian Empire, who wrote down the oldest recorded account of the arrival of their gods, and the subsequent creation of mankind, for their own purposes. Now these are not unidentified flying objects, these are flying objects, and I guarantee you there is such a thing. The Air Force believes in them, and uh, they have, uh, they're dedicated to trying to discover uh, what they are. Uh, but I know exactly what they are, and they are coming to the earth. There are real UFOs in the Bible. The Bible speaks of flying, palleted, saucer-shaped ships with portholes all around the outside that flies at the speed of light, emits burning coals when it sits on the ground, has lightning emanating from it, electrical discharges. Uh, with that burnt spots that are on the ground, there's charred pieces of material left underneath them when they park. And they're piloted by strange, multi-headed, multi-eyed, and multi-winged creatures that are a combination of humanoid and animal and bird features. And the Bible describes a time when they will come to the earth and men will have heart attacks at seeing them come. That's all in your Bible. from the Greek angelos, literally translated, messenger. In the third chapter of Exodus, 
Moses converses with God via an angel or messenger. A messenger of God appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And behold, the bush burned with fire. Yet it was not consumed. روزگاری که مادر از برای آگاهی من لب سخن می گشود عشق را در کلامش نور را در دلش و پاکی را در نگاهش می فهمیدم. و آن زمان که از ایران می گفت گونه هایش تر می شد و نگاهش خیره و آنگاه که مرا درس خرد ورزی میداد در گوشم گات ها را نجوا می کرد حال که او به آسمان پرکشیده است و در افق ناپیدا من آن سرود ها را به یادش می خوانم تا پرواز را خود بیاموزم از روز The religious system of Mesopotamia was polytheism, which means that they worshipped hundreds of different gods, both male and female, often depicted in human form, having personalities very much like people do. And um, these gods were arranged in a kind of political hierarchy that in many ways mimicked the political systems of Mesopotamia itself. Now, according to the Sumerian text, the heavenly gods, the Anunnaki, were the supreme deities, the higher deities. In cuneiform texts, the Anunnaki are described in great detail, including how they lived for hundreds of years. They had tremendous knowledge and power uh, over the entire world. They knew everything. They had knowledge of all of the sciences and arts. Where they got this knowledge and where they came from is a complete mystery to archaeologists. Anunnaki is a term that means from heaven to earth they came. So the knowledge that came out from Nineveh is a complete look of a civilization that sprung up out of nowhere. Many of the tablets that were unearthed in Nineveh describe nuances into the actual mindset of the gods, these Anunnaki, and they describe being flesh and blood beings just like us. The Anunnaki themselves were physical beings that came here in giant spaceships that our ancestors thought were some type of divine apparitions. The Sumerian king list was found on a tablet in ancient Mesopotamia and dates to somewhere around 2100 BC. The list contains names of 140 kings. What's most interesting about this list is that the deities have enormously long lives. One king, for example, ruled for 36,000 years. 
And you have to wonder, how could people have lived that long? But yet we have the same thing in the Bible. Methuselah and Noah lived to be eight or 900 years old, which seems so fantastic to us. When juxtaposed together, both the Sumerian creation account and the Hebrew Bible, more specifically, the Old Testament, is by far the best, most well-documented account of otherworldly beings interacting with early humanity we have with us today. Every ancient culture we have discovered all tell us a similar story about the gods. They came from the stars, gave us knowledge, and then departed. This singular shared memory seems to be the recurring thread present in all remaining modern day religious sects. The Sumerians tell of beings they called Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came. They tell how they encountered primitive hominids, and, in need of a workforce to mine for minerals, they spliced their own DNA with that of ancient man, and so the first human, Adamu, was created.
the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He said unto the woman, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of any tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. The fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened shall be his gods. Once our ancestors settled, their fascination with the skies went into overdrive. They built massive structures to make extremely detailed observations. But the question is, why? Why did the ancients construct such huge buildings to observe the skies when they didn't have to? It's hard for me to understand why you build a gigantic monument out of stones that's the hard way to do it. And I don't think you get budgets for astronomy to build things bigger than you need to do. All sorts of mysteries surround the construction of these monuments and why they were built. Some theories suggest that instead of just observing the skies, they might have been erected using knowledge from visitors from another world. That's the idea behind the ancient astronaut theory. And the ancient astronaut theory tries to establish whether or not extraterrestrials visited Earth in the remote past. So why do we think it's even remotely possible that people of prehistory were visited by aliens? Because ancient texts from cultures around the world speak of mysterious beings cruising the skies in chariots of fire and bringing humanity wisdom from the cosmos. The Mahabharata, an ancient Indian epic, which is their equivalent of the Bible, is packed with stories of gods which a long, long time ago flew around in marvelous golden sky ships referred to as Vimanas. They were also very specific in mentioning that they are machines made out of metal. It describes their weaponry, that some Vimanas had the capability of cloaking themselves to become invisible. All crazy science fiction type stuff. But was it really science fiction? That's the big question. And the South Americans, Asians, and Egyptians all have mythologies that speak of beings who came to Earth aboard cosmic eggs. These cosmic eggs appear in virtually every single creation story of each culture all around the world. They all begin the same way that one day, the heavens opened and this silver cosmic egg descended from the sky and 
these gods came out of these eggs and taught mankind in various disciplines. During World War II, American troops created air bases on remote Pacific islands. To natives who had never witnessed advanced technology, the sight of giant metal birds touching down looked to them as if the gods themselves had turned the earth into a planetary pit stop. They would see these big planes land, and, and it was all technology that, that, that just was out of the sky. They didn't know how these things worked, but they could see them land. And what they liked about it was they were getting free stuff. They were getting cargo. Suddenly, when the war was over, all these airstrips were abandoned and everyone left. And the islanders scratched their heads and they all said to themselves, wow, wasn't it great when those, all these planes came out of the sky and gave us free cans of corned beef and stuff? We really liked that cargo. Entire religions sprung up from this, where priests actually said, yes, you know, uh, that was our dead ancestors sending us cargo. So what they did then was they began going to the old airstrips and they would build mock wooden airplanes to try and get those planes to come back from the sky and deliver the cans of corned beef to them again. And so you can see how then an analogy with modern cargo cults plays exactly into the ancient astronaut scenario where something like this could have easily happened in the past and entire religions built around ancient astronauts. The man in charge is Chief Isaac, and he explains how in the 1940s, a god appeared on Tana in the form of an American soldier named John Frum. The god told them that if they rejected Christian missionaries and stayed true to old customs, they would be rewarded with boatloads of American cargo. Well, then came World War II, and boatloads of American cargo. Prophecy fulfilled, they thought. And to this day, the U.S. flag is a religious symbol for this so-called cargo cult. So the volcano speaks to you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Wow. You have to be ready. And they believe John Frum lives inside the volcano with their ancestors. In fact, Chief Isaac warns that if our hearts are not pure, climbing the volcano could bring danger and pain. This message is being broadcast at the request of the United States government. At 5.26 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, several transmissions were received by the SETI Radio Transmission Observatory in Mount Amelie, California. These messages appear to contain several parts of a large image containing what appears to be ancient form script. This has not been confirmed yet. However, several second-hand reports are coming in suggesting the same. These transmissions appear to have been beamed directly and intentionally at Earth's radio observatory. We do not know what these messages say, mean or where they originate from. Stay tuned to this network for further updates.
set atop the Giesel Plateau. Stand three massive pyramids. To this day, mainstream academia cannot fully explain how, when, or why they were built. Tira Kurani Singare Sira Jamba Singare Sira Kurani West Africa lives a tribe of people called the Dogon. They are believed to be of Egyptian descent, and their astronomical lore goes back thousands of years. According to their traditions, the star Sirius, as a companion star which is invisible to the human eye. And they uh, are from Mali, which is a country in the northwest bulge of Africa. And uh, in my uh, opinion, the Dogon tribe, for anybody who is interested in ancient symbols or ancient religion and what it all means, the Dogon are a great untapped resource. A 
desert tribe called the Dogon, isolated in the African wilderness, may have identified a star invisible to the unaided eye. How is this possible? How could the Dogon possess this sophisticated astronomical information? The tribal legend tells us that beings called Numo descended from the sacred star and appeared before the Dogon ancestors. The Dogon were entrusted by the Numo with 366 symbols given without meaning. The Dogon were charged with interpreting them and preserving the information for future generations. The symbols reveal an astonishing scope of astronomical knowledge an infinite number of stars and spiraling worlds. One of the best examples of classic UFO story is the story of Moses. 3,500 years ago, an epic period in biblical history begins when Israelite slaves are finally released from bondage in Egypt. Under the leadership of Moses, they begin a 40-year trek through the wilderness and route to the Promised Land. But according to the Bible, Something very mysterious guides the multitude through the barren desert. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Exodus 14:21. Some believe the biblical passage contains another dimension to the meaning long cherished by most Christians and Jews. Some people interpret the uh, pillar of smoke and, and the pillar of fire that Moses followed through the wilderness as being uh, similar to a cigar-shaped UFO. It expresses a, a theme of, of an extraterrestrial intelligence, some sort of advanced form of life and intelligence that's guiding man, something that's higher than man. Uh, there, are, there are scientists that believe that there are intelligent entities inhabiting other planets. There, there are scientists that believe that, and other galaxies. And there are some who have credence in what we call UFOs, unidentified uh, foreign objects or flying objects and they believe in the landings and they believe in little creatures from outer space and their evidence in this is not sufficient for you and me today others believe that you can communicate with the dead by unknown entities that there is a possibility that you can have a speaking voice coming to you and that this can be done through an alien an alien entity we just know that in this generation, beginning this moment, right now, common knowledge must be brought to all of us. If our citizens of all nations could come to know the total truth of alien entities, we could win this battle. That means it's a battle against ignorance. Say ignorance. It is a battle against ignorance. It is remarkable, and, and please remember this, it's very remarkable to me that in primitive and primitive persons, like some living in Central Africa, or in the top of Tibet, or in the jungles of, of Indonesia, they know much more about alien entities or demons than most seminar, uh, seminary professors and pastors of churches in the United States of America. This is a pity and a shame that some primitive people know more on the subject than some who think they have been trained to direct immortal souls. But this seed that mingles itself with the, with the seed of men, uh, the first time this happened was in Genesis chapter number six, when the angels, sons of God, saw the daughters of men, came to them and cohabited with them, and the Nephilim were born. The Nephilim are the Hebrew, from the Hebrew word, Nafal. 
and it's translated giants in Genesis chapter number 6. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. These giants are one of the, are one of the most well-attested things on the earth and one of the most hidden. Most history classes gloss over the giants as if they never existed. But all you have to do is just do just a little bit of reading and you'll be amazed at the amount of information available to show you the giants that have lived and are living on this earth.
Hello from the children of planet Earth. Hola y saludos a todos. 各位都好吧，我们都很想念你们，有空请到这儿来玩。Hello from the children of planet Earth. I've been a preacher for more than 30 years. I've studied and taught through the Book of Genesis many, many times in churches all around the world, and I've trained pastors in the skills of interpreting texts. And it's very clear they're not stories about gods. They're stories about the powerful ones in the Bible and the sky people, the Anunnaki, in the Sumerian tablets. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12:07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in San Agustin, New Mexico. Was read the Sumerian and Babylonian and Assyrian texts, and notice that they were full of fascinating parallels, stories that occurred there. That were uncannily similar to all the stories of beginnings of the Bible. Stories like Adam and Eve,、uh, the fall, Cain and Abel, the flood, the limiting of human life, the event at the Tower of Babel, and Schmidt's work demonstrated that the Sumerian accounts and those that followed it from nearly six thousand years ago were, in all probability, the source. Of all those familiar biblical stories. Now that was a problem in the 1890s, because if you think about it, the church was still reeling from the after effects of Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*, and it was busy putting together new doctrinal bases and new doctrines of biblical inerrancy to shore up the ship. So the idea that the Bible might actually be based on somebody else's stories was a bit of an embarrassment. It shouldn't have been. Because Judaism and Christianity both find their roots in the story of a Sumerian family, the family of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah grew up and spent the best part of their lives in Ur of the Chaldees, a Sumerian culture, and so when they emigrated from there, it's hardly surprising that they would carry with them all the stories of beginnings that they had grown up with. And so them into the foundations of what was to become their culture, their religion, and their Bible. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that in the Bible we have a summary version of all these stories that pepper the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian texts. The problem and the shock horror is that the original versions, the Sumerian versions of these stories, make no mention of God at all. In the Sumerian originals, these are stories of our ancestors' contact with another species, a species called the Anunnaki. In 1849, thousands of Sumerian cuneiforms were found northwest of Ur, at the ancient cities of Sippar and Nippur. In 1849. Henry Layard performed many excavations on the Sippar site and discovered about 20,000 tablets, 
Sumerian and Akkadian. And amongst all the tablets discovered, about a dozen of them are about the Garden of Eden. Sumero-Akkadian researcher and author of eight books regarding Sumerian translation, Anton Parks, believes that for hundreds of years, we have been translating these tablets wrong. Gary Zeitlin, who is a scientist who worked on the SETI project for many years and collaborated with NASA, he was very interested in the Sumerian translations and he provided me with these 10 tablets found at Sippar to check symbols one by one. I noticed one translation saying one thing and the other saying sometimes the complete opposite. The two translations did not comply. I persistently did research on Hebrew, but nothing was coming out of it. And then completely by chance, I came across a Sumero-Akkadian lexicon. And this is when I could finally, slowly start to translate the tablets. In biblical text, we constantly read about this idea of heaven or paradise. This comes from the Greek paradisios, and this literally means enclosure for wild animals. Not paradise, a term that was later transcribed as garden during the Hellenistic era. If we go back to the original translation in the Sumerian tablets, it says, the men who serve the gods work for them in the garden and are treated like animals. It is a very clear and recurrent theme they are slaves who serve the divine community. The following message is transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified objects of unknown intent and unknown origin were detected at high altitudes over mutable locations of Earth's outer space by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in San Augustine, New Mexico. These objects are presumed to be some form of controlled aircraft. It is not known if more of these aircraft will arrive or if they will attempt entering Earth's atmosphere. United States citizens are encouraged to monitor local media outlets as more updates will follow as information becomes available. One of the earliest written records of an encounter with a UFO comes from Egypt more than 3,500 years ago. There's a story about Tutmos III, Egyptian pharaoh, who saw circles of fire in the sky and uh, started off with one, and then the report says that there were a few days later, there were many of them in the sky. And uh, he was, was so impressed that this was uh, recorded on a papyrus and uh, considered uh, very momentous. In the year 22 of the third month of the winter, a circle of fire appeared in the sky. After some days, it became more numerous and shone with the brightness of the sun, extending to the very limits of the heavens. The records of Pharaoh Tutmosis, 1480 BCE. The Bible speaks of flying, palleted, saucer-shaped ships with portholes all around the outside that flies at the speed of light, emits burning coals when it sits on the ground, has lightning emanating from it, electrical discharges. Uh, with that burnt spots that are on the ground, there's charred pieces of material left underneath them when they park. And they're piloted by strange, multi-headed, multi-eyed, and multi-winged creatures that are a combination of humanoid and animal and bird features. That's all in your Bible. Now, just because you didn't know that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. How many times have you read the Bible all the way through? Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, begins one passage on the subject. Uh, Ezekiel has a vision and he says that he is among the rivers captive on the river Chebar. Among the captives on the river Chebar and he has a vision. 
He said, the Lord, word of the Lord came unto Ezekiel expressly. And uh, it said to him, and then God gives him this vision of uh, God himself, a fire enfolding itself, of a great burning light that comes, that sparkles, and uh, it, it brightness around about it. And then he said, in the midst thereof, of this bright light, which was God, was the likeness of four living creatures. Now, he doesn't define them because they don't fit any, they're not human, they're not animal, they're just living creatures. And he says, their appearance was as the likeness of a man. So the shadow they would cast, the form they would have, would be structured like a man with uh, feet, uh, legs, knees, hips, torso, arms in the same place, and head. So similar to a man's structure. And every one had four faces. So these guys have a face, not four heads, but four faces. And they had every one four wings. So they have two here and two on the front side like this. So each face has one wing. And their feet were straight feet as the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. So they have cloven hooves instead of feet like we do. And they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. So they've got that warm brass sparkly color about them. And they had the hands of a man under their wings. Did you ever catch a bat and look at it up close? So you, you pick them up and look at them. Their faces look kind of humanoid, but they have these mammal wings and right out here, it looked like it'd be right here, but it's actually here, it are, are little hands. It's kind of like a little human hand right here. Now, the fingers are the ends of the wings. They stick out this way. So it, uh, it, it has uh, maybe this part, and then they got that little hand right there. And so when they pick up fruit, their wings reach out like this, grab the fruit, and they pick it up and hold it in their mouth and eat it this way. So fascinating little creatures. Now, sometimes you see angels painted with wings. No angel ever has a wing, but these cherubim do. And their wings are not feathered wings. You see artists painting feathered wings on heavenly creatures. Uh, they don't have, they don't have the, the feathered the wings. They have, they have mammal, mammal wings. wings. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena or as light aberrations. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports 
that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate, uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. Is that? We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. I'll, I'll start when you throw it down. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. Messages transmitted at the request of the United States government. At 12.07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, numerous unidentified aircraft of unknown intent and unknown origin simultaneously appeared at high altitudes over multiple locations of Earth's outer space. These aircraft were detected by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in San Augustine, New Mexico. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. These hostile aircraft continue to descend into the skies of Earth through what are now designated as wormholes.
these aircraft are using an unknown type of directed energy weaponry that is believed to emit very harmful radiation in the form of beams, hot enough to instantaneously incinerate anyone within the vicinity. Behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. And all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. These aircraft and entities are now believed to be of extraterrestrial origin. In addition, there are reports that these aircraft are carrying unidentified entities that are disembarking from the aircraft and traversing the land. These entities are described as being dark with blackened eyes, having a scaly skin, standing around seven feet tall, and communicating in a distinct vocalization of loud knocks and whispering clicks.